Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. This is the Treatment Planning with Digital Workflows webinar hosted by Imagine and presented by Dr. Melissa Seibert. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. We appreciate you spending your time with us, and uh, we're looking forward to sharing some great tips, tricks, and workflows that are allowed by uh, digital dentistry. Um, my name is Neil DeMajor. I'm the Executive Vice President of Sales here at Imagine, uh, and I'm going to be something of a moderator tonight. Um, but uh, the the real star of the show, who we're really happy to have joining us tonight, is Dr. Melissa Seibert, who is a comprehensive dentist with the United States Air Force, and she is also the host of the Dental Digest podcast, which is one of the more popular uh, dental podcasts out there. If you don't listen to Dr. Seibert on there, by all means, find it wherever you get your podcasts and go ahead and subscribe to that because there's a ton of great information to be had there, both in terms of digital dentistry as well as just dentistry overall. She does a great job there. Um, if you're interested in anything you hear uh, tonight during the presentation, um, I'm going to provide a link in the chat here um, and you can follow that to fill out a quick little form and reach out to us to learn a little bit more. Um, likewise, uh, if you're interested in having a recording of tonight's presentation, um, we're going to make that available to everybody as well. So go ahead and fill out that form. Uh, to get access to that recording, as well as a, a special offer that we're making available to everybody who is uh, attending the webinar tonight. Um, also, we're going to have the Q&A uh, function open here throughout the course of the presentation. Um, whenever questions pop up to mind, um, don't wait to ask them you know, at an at a opportune time. Go ahead and ask them whenever they pop to mind. I'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A and we'll uh, forward those messages over to Dr. Seibert whenever we have a pause in the presentation or a good time to kind of handle them. So um, with that said, um, I think all that's left to do is, is introduce Dr. Melissa Seibert. There she is. I'm going to go ahead and spotlight you for everybody, Dr. Seibert, so that you can kind of take it away from here. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing everything you have to share with us tonight. Awesome. <clears throat> Hey, you all, thank you so much for coming out tonight. I know that there's a lot of different things that you could be doing in your evening. So this speaks very highly of you as a clinician. Uh, and it shows that you're interested in learning more. Also, you're gonna have to forgive me. I'm gonna be standing for the duration of this presentation. I am nine months pregnant. And so sitting, uh, I get quite scrunched up and pretty uncomfortable. So I'm gonna be standing. Um, so with that, I'm gonna share my screen and let's get into the presentation tonight. So uh, Neil, let me know if you can't see my screen, but I'm just going to assume you guys can. So in this presentation, I'm going to be talking about restoratively driven implants with a digital workflow. In this presentation, though, I'm going to talk about a whole host of topics. Let's say that you are not doing implants in your practice or really even surgery at all. You certainly don't need to do that to get a lot out of this presentation. And of course, just standard disclaimer, nothing that I'm presenting tonight is reflective or endorsed by the Air Force. Uh, and this presentation does not constitute any sort of formal relationship between the Department of Defense or Air Force and Imagine. I'm not being compensated for this presentation at all, um, but I consider the people at Imagine good friends. They have really uh, supported me throughout my digital journey and supported me with great educational resources. I've really enjoyed my relationship with them. Um, there's a lot of distributors if you're interested in using Exocad, but these guys have exceptional customer service. So again, a little bit about me. I went to the Air Force Academy for undergrad, and then I did a semester exchange at West Point while I was there. I started my dental journey at the University of Louisville. Then from there, I did a one-year AGD at Barksdale Air Force Base where I gained a whole host of skills, everything from uh, chair side same day dentistry to surgeries, to perio surgeries, complex thermolar exodontia, IV sedation, ortho aesthetic dentistry, complex treatment planning. I really learned it all. Uh, so then I practiced for a few years and realized that I wanted to continue my educational journey. I wanted to become a super dentist. I wanted to do it all. And um, the great thing about being a bit of a super dentist is that you can kind of begin to choose. So if there's something that you don't enjoy doing, you don't necessarily always have to do that. So I did the Air Force's exceptional program, their conference of dentistry residency, two-year residency, AGD. You get a master's, you do research, and you refine your skills. 
About me personally, I'm the creator and host of the Dental Digest podcast, which is in the top 1% of all podcasts globally, and it's the number one clinical dental podcast. It's won multiple awards. Uh, we are nominated again this year for most educational podcast in dentistry. Stay tuned because they're going to be announcing that soon. I was also recently awarded top 40 under 40 dentists in America, and I do a lot of speaking, teaching, and writing. <laughs> So <clears throat> let me start out with a story here. When I was in dental school, I was always a bit confused about implants because what would happen is that we would have a patient with partial edentulism and the staff on the floor, great people. But what they would say is go consult oral surgery, have the oral surgeon come down. And if the oral surgeon determined that the patient was suitable for an implant, then that patient would get an implant. There was really no regard or consideration for <clears throat> Uh, whether or not the patient had the restorative space for this, uh, the consequences of placing this implant, the implant was just placed. And then we as the restorative providers had to do a lot of backtracking and finagling to figure out how to suitably restore this implant. And unfortunately, there were a few times where the implant was placed in the aesthetic zone in such a way that uh, unfortunately the implant was not restorable and that's a bad day for the patient. So, there's multiple different approaches to implant planning, and I'm gonna really show you how digital platforms can enable you to do restoratively driven implants with an interdisciplinary approach. So what should be driving implant placement? Well, there's different schools of thoughts. You can have the interdisciplinary approach where all of the members on the implant team are engaged, they're on board, they know what's going on. Then you can have the multidisciplinary approach. This is where the patient is effectively farmed off to the different actors. So maybe you decide the patient needs an implant and you're not even restoring it. So you send the patient to the oral surgeon that you like to work with. And then, you know, perhaps then you send the patient to the prosthodontist to restore it, or maybe you're restoring it, but there's no communication. Um, it's just sort of a guessing game with what they want to do and people aren't on the same page. Well, that's the multidisciplinary approach, which we frankly so often see, and not just with implants, but a lot of restorations, a lot of treatment planning. You know, maybe the endodontist goes ahead and completes the endo, but the tooth isn't actually restorable, or they do it in such a way that it might inhibit your restorative plan. There's no communication. So this is not what's getting the patient the idealized outcome. Is a multidisciplinary approach suitable if you're just replacing a single tooth implant? Sure. But in my practice, so often those are not the kinds of patients that I'm seeing. I hardly see a slam dunk implant case. So again, there's the surgical model where what we're considering is, you know, medical systemic considerations. Can the patient tolerate this implant? Is the patient suitable for this implant? Is this a patient that could succumb to peri-implant disease? Um, or we might be considering other things such as, you know, is there adequate bone? Is there adequate distance that we can achieve from the adjacent implants or the adjacent teeth? Because after all, we want about three millimeters from adjacent implants, and we want about 1.5 millimeters from implant to tooth. But oftentimes when it comes to implant planning, what I see is that this is where it all stops. They determine these kind of considerations, and then if the patient's suitable, they're getting an implant in the story. But if anybody here has restored an implant, they know that that's creating a whole host of complications. And so with these peer surgical models, sometimes this requires a lot of backtracking from the restorative dentist. So we see this case right here. I'm grateful this is not my case, nor even a case of a friend or colleague. This is something that I pulled off of Google, but this is an example of an implant that's entirely non-restorable, where you know, it was placed without any consideration for the plan. And so this is actually a patient that was in my practice where <clears throat> the patient was referred to me for orthodontic intrusion, because as you can see right here, we don't really have a lot of space. The implant was placed and the patient's mouth is actually open, but the patient was occluding on the healing abutment. Um, so hardly restorable. Really the only way I could see this conceivably being restorable is that if it was screw retained and I was using maybe gold, and that's the only way I could see it being a possibility and maybe doing an aggressive enamel plasty, but that's not really ideal. Um, so we had to orthodontically intrude this tooth, which is, again, that's a hard movement to do. So then with a purely restorative model, this can also be impractical. You know, I've seen cases where restorative dentists 
will give their surgeon a surgical guide and where it's ideal for it to be replaced restoratively, surgically, it's not even feasible. The implant would actually be entirely out of the crestal plate. Um, it wouldn't even be encased in bone. <laughs> so we also have to be practical. So what am I talking about when I'm saying for the implant to be restoratively driven? Well, we want the implant to accommodate the restoration. We want to design where the implant should, where the implant crown, where the final restoration should be in space. And then our implant placement is going to follow suit. <laughs> Some of these are debated. Not every school of thought necessarily agrees with this line of thinking. But ideally, we want the forces to be down the long axis of the implant. We'd like to avoid lateral forces when we can. Uh, that can put stress on the prosthesis. That could perhaps uh, destroy the screw. The screw could break. Um, and we want to avoid excessive cantilevers when we can. So we have to not only be considering these surgical considerations, but also the restorative considerations. We want our implant planning and our treatment planning to be facially driven. So here, what I'm using is ExoCAD's dental CAD application their smile design feature, where with this, I can position the teeth in space where they should be and base it all off of the patient's smile and the patient's desires. You know, so often the way I was trained in dental school with designing a case, even if this was an anterior case, is that I would do it on an articulator and wax it up. And it was always um, interesting to see the way the case transferred in the patient's actual face. Because first of all, when you're using articulator, when you're using a face bow, we were accepting some inaccuracy. But then we couldn't see this overlaid on the patient's face. Uh, we couldn't see the way it smiled, the, followed the smile line. So for example, ideally, we want the incisal edges to follow the patient's smile line. Uh, we wanna keep in mind how much of their gingiva is actually shown when they're smiling. And so with this feature, this is a case we're gonna go into that the patient was missing nine and 10. And so I'm actually using their smile to design everything. Then also for restoratively driven cases, we wanna begin with teeth in space. So there's just different schools of thoughts. And if we're perhaps doing a case where we're very accommodating of what might already exist, then I'm just gonna place the teeth into the position where it's easiest for me, where I have to do the least amount of changes. But when we're talking about placing teeth in space, this is where the teeth are going, where they ought to in the patient's head. And then we're retroactively planning our surgeries in our cases. So maybe we determined that we have to do some sort of orthodontic intrusion, <clears throat> or maybe we have to do some sort of grafting. Here's an example of a case where I also use ExoCAD dental CAD application to then adjust her occlusal plane as needed, add some of the hard and soft tissue back. So everything could go where it ideally needed to be. So as you can see in this mandibular arch, we've had some corruption of the occlusal plane. We have a bit of a reverse curve of speed. And so maybe old me when I was starting out on my journey, what I would have done is just position the teeth so I can get the idealized contact. But I would just be replicating that reverse curve of speed on the maxillary arch, which just could lead to problems. She also has a very big uh, smile. She has buckle corridors where we see a lot of her teeth when she smiles. So that's not quite ideal. <clears throat> what I want to be doing is intruding her mandibular teeth and planning accordingly. So that's what I did. I used the paint pull feature to then go ahead and level her mandibular occlusal plane. I then positioned the maxillary ponics into place where they should be. And I realized that um, it wasn't going to be feasible to achieve all the grafting that I needed to. I needed to add back in some pink gingiva. And so that's what I did. And this helped me to be able to plan what we ultimately ended up doing, which was an implant retained FDP. So the big challenges with interdisciplinary implant dentistry or even just interdisciplinary treatment planning, or just tackling a complex case is that we want to achieve precision. We want to be able to execute on our plan. We want good communication, communication with the patient, communication with our lab, communication with anybody else that's involved in the case. And of course, we want good case acceptance. Um, nothing is more discouraging. And I'm guessing that everybody that's been on this call has faced this before, where they've worked 
very hard to design a case. And then the patient walks away. They're not even interested. And so I have leveraged the software to facilitate precision, communication, and case acceptance. Let's go back to that case that you originally saw where the patient was missing nine and 10. This was a hard case because the patient wasn't necessarily aesthetically demanding, but he was very demanding time-wise. But there were a lot of variables in this case um, that required us to actually have an extensive and lengthy treatment plan. So through this, I was of course able to get precision. I was able to execute on what I wanted, but I was also able to facilitate good case acceptance and communication. So what I did is I started by using the dental CAD apps um, smile design feature where I overlaid the patient's portrait photo with his existing cast. Why would I do this? What's the benefit of doing any of this? Well, with the analog model, again, as I mentioned, we're accepting a lot of inaccuracy. Facebook articulators, these are all based on averages. But not only that, when it comes to case acceptance, if I'm going to be showing a patient a case, this could be a $30,000 case or an extensive case that's going to take a year, maybe two, three years. I want them to get excited and I want them to understand where we're going and why. Because ultimately, I want them to be partners in the decision making process. With analog, if I'm presenting this case to them and I'm just showing them stone and wax, it's not going to translate to them. They're not really going to understand why we're making the decisions that we are. Because think about it, to you, if you were going to go out and buy a very nice car, if someone were to just show you uh, maybe something the size of a deck of playing cards, the type of car that you're going to buy, you're not really going to bite off on this. You want to see the real thing. You want to test drive it. You want to experience it. And so when we go from analog to digital, it becomes much more palpable to them. So I also like to really engage and include the patient in the process when this is a big case and when it's reasonable and feasible to do so. So what I did is I took him through the smile design um, process. He got to sit with me chair side and he actually got to see the work that I was putting into his case. This made him more appreciative of what we were doing and understanding the complexity and the considerations. But also he got to give me real time feedback what he wanted out of the case, which I also really appreciate because we've all been there in cases where maybe we sent it off to a lab or we've designed it ourselves. We're spending a lot of time in this case and the patient ends up just saying that they don't like it or that they're not happy with it. Well, the benefit of this is that we can cut out a lot of that. They can be actively engaged in the process and be partners in their health. So, Initially, I use the feature because it gives you sort of a whole tooth library of different teeth. And I initially put that into the place of nine and 10. The benefit of having the tooth library is that if you're going with a dental technician, the dental technician is going to use their same sort of signature wax of their signature design. Let's say the patient or let's say the lab technician always does very prominent mammalons, prominent lobes. Maybe they neglect tertiary anatomy you name it, when you send it off to the lab, you're oftentimes gonna see that. But with a tooth library, we can leverage technology where we can go through different sets of teeth so we can identify what's most suitable for that patient. And so that's what we did. That's what we started with the tooth library and I got the patient's input on the process and you gotta see how we were positioning the teeth. One of the challenges with this case though is that actually he's been missing these teeth for so long that number nine and 10, um, we don't quite have the same amount of space for them as we'd ideally like to. But again, it was nice to be able to go through this tooth library and select the teeth because what I'm doing is I'm trying to pick teeth based on what fits his face most. One of the criticisms for this software is that people will say, oh, you're just plugging and playing denture teeth. But that's really far from the case because you start out with an initial tooth, but then you can use the different design features to pick other teeth or to go ahead and modify it however you need to. So we played for that for a while. And then he determined that he actually likes the morphology of seven and eight. It's not necessarily what I would have picked out for him, but that really doesn't matter. So then we use the copy mirror function um, to go ahead and replicate seven and eight. 
And this was also nice because this kind of helped to prove and demonstrate to the patient that we did have some limited space on nine and 10. He declined limited ortho to create a little bit more room, but it was good for us to be able to have that informed conversation with him. So here we go. Once we use the copy mirror function, I was able to replicate seven and eight right then and there. Again, I'm not crazy about the crown on number eight. This is actually a hybrid ceramic, so <laughs> kind of a printed composite on a stick situation, but the patient wasn't really crazy about, or the patient was totally okay with that. I'm not crazy about it, but it doesn't matter. But again, here's the copy mirror function. I use this function actually quite frequently. So if there's a tooth that the patient really likes and they want me to replicate, I can do that. But with implant planning, I will typically, let's say I'm planning for a posterior molar. I will copy and paste that tooth rather than having to spend the extensive time to wax up a tooth if I like the occlusal scheme. If I don't, then I'm gonna start from the beginning. So here you go. Through using the copy and mirror function, I was able to demonstrate to the patient that we don't quite have the same amount of space on 9 and 10 that we need. Um, he declined ortho, so I was having to explain to him some of the modifications that we were going to have to make to create that space. So what's so beneficial of using the smile design feature is that we can see things, how they actually look in his head, in his actual smile. And Initially, when I showed you that copy mirror of the tooth, you might, some of you might have noticed that nine is a little bit longer than eight. It looks a little bit awkward, but what's so helpful is once we actually see this in his head, in his smile, that's what we can identify that, yep, things are not the way they should be. It's not follow the lower lip line. Um, so then right then and there, we're able to make those modifications. This is also helpful because he can sit with me chair side and tell me what he doesn't like if there's anything else that he wants to change. I like this because I've been in enough situations where I get a wax up back from the lab, the wax up looks ideal, but when I go to transfer it onto the patient, it doesn't match and we're spending precious chair time making adjustments. You can also use the true smile feature to get a rough idea of what this would look like um, rather than it actually being gold or blue, but what this would actually look like as a tooth. I will say this feature, I think, needs a little bit more development because when you look at this right here, it's not quite as obvious. Um, it doesn't match as much, but it's still a possibility. So what I did, though, still using that true smile feature, which you can see is highlighted orange in the right, I used that, and then I was able to take screenshots for the patient. And again, in the real world, he actually could see his whole face, but I just want to protect the patient's identity. So all you can see right here is a smile. But he was able to take this and take these screenshots home to his wife, and they were able to talk about the treatment. Because after we designed it, I had a better idea of the roadmap for where we were going to go. So um, I was able to talk with that about the patient, but this was an extensive process. This required a couple surgeries, and he was able to take this home to his wife, talk to her about it, talk about the plan that was ahead, and they were able to determine if this was right for them. So this is a lot nicer than perhaps sending the patient home with a picture or a model. He can actually see what he would look like. Then the next step is I took this case and I loaded it into the virtual articulator, which this is also very helpful um, because it takes a lot of the guesswork out. And so you're not spending time doing a lot of chair side adjustments. You can select just about any articulator. Most of the major articulators on the market are available in this articulator app. And so um, what you can do is then you can print this and then transfer this onto the articulator if you have that in your office. Next, I'm able to use the different features to then do the articulation simulation. So I'm able to determine if this design was viable. I can take it through lateral obtrusive, left, right, protrusive, you name it, and determine if there's any interferences. The question in this case, when it comes to implant planning, was determining, do we want to do one or two implants? Because after all, the patient's missing two teeth. We have the option we can place two implants. We could do no implants at all and do resin-bonded FTPs. We could do one implant and cantilever the ponic off that, or we could do an implant and uh, do a resin bonded FTP off of the other tooth. 
oftentimes it can become a challenge if you're placing two implants um, to be able to get good papilla fill because you need just the right distance and positioning. So I was able to have a discussion with the patient about what he wanted to do because what I did is I took the rapid pre-planning feature um, so that it wasn't a surprise the day of surgery or I wasn't spending extensive time trying to get two implants to work. So again, you can see in the right, there's the implant planning feature and then there's the rapid pre-planning feature. I first selected the pre-planning feature to then determine if we have adequate space. So now we're in the exoplan application. Exoplan is generally where we do a lot of our implant planning uh, and exo CADs dental CAD app, that's where we do a lot of the design. What I did is I did the designing in dental CAD and then I transferred that and brought that into exoplan. Although you don't always have to do that. You can design the case in exoplan, although I found some of the features are a bit more limited. Um, but I know they're always making iterations to that, so it might be such that now you can make those adjustments. But what I did in the pre-planning feature is that I just quickly plunked in two implants that were reasonable size, reasonable brand that I wanted to go with. And right away, you can see that there's just no conceivable way we're going to be able to fit two implants in there. So it lit up bright red, and this was helpful because I'm able to talk to the patient about why two implants just are not gonna fit. You can see it's turning bright red, it's not feasible. It's helpful for the software to light up like this because then it makes it much easier to explain to the patient why we're making the decisions that we are. Uh, they don't feel like they're being cheated out of an opportunity or out of a second implant. You can say, oh, the software is giving me warning signs um, and alarm bells that this is not a viable option. We're only to, able to place one implant, and then we're going to have to make a decision about the PONIC that we're going to do for the second tooth. One of the options, let's say that you get to the point of preliminary implant placement or initial design with the treatment plan. What's nice is that, you know, I was talking about communication between you and your colleagues and the whole idea of multidisciplinary versus interdisciplinary treatment planning. With these more complex cases, you want there to be full informed consent um, and awareness for what's going on. By using the dental share application on ExoCAD, I'm able to transfer the case to anybody else that's involved. So I, as a restorative dentist, might do the design and then share it with a colleague for implant planning or alternatively vice versa. Um, and so if they have ExoCAD, they can access it all through Dental Share. What you do is you upload it and then they're gonna get a notification and they're gonna become aware that the project was sent to them. Alternatively and historically, what's been done is people might meet over Zoom, they might use Google Drive or HIPAA protected software to transfer cases, or they might actually meet in person. Um, but this eats up a lot of time. Um, I can hardly see people that are really able to sit down in a coffee shop and go over these cases. Maybe if this is a full mouth $50,000 rehab case, possibly. Um, but this sort of cuts out a lot of that. And it also cuts out a lot of the guesswork about what direction are we going in. Because with something this complex, you don't want to leave anything to certainty and you don't want anybody guessing what the roadmap is. And by the way, I would definitely welcome any questions that you all might have um, with, at about 7.20, I'm gonna stop so that you guys can ask any questions. Another option though is WebView. If you don't have ExoCAD, but you wanna be integrally involved in the, in the communication design process, I highly recommend WebView. I would even say go and play around with that tonight. Uh, you can, they have different models, different STLs that you can toggle through. So if you're interested in WebView, here is a QR code. I will give you a few seconds to snap a photo of that or just use that so you can check out what WebView is. Yeah, props for highlighting WebView. It's one of my favorite functions of ExoCAD. Most people aren't aware of it, but it's great because you don't need to have ExoCAD at all. Like you can send it to literally anybody, right? You can view it on your mobile device. You can view it on your computer. Like don't need any special software at all. And you can add and remove different features or meshes. Uh, you can rotate it around, look at it from whatever angle you like. I think it's a super great tool. So yeah, good call on, on highlighting it. 
it's great and it's fun, but also it's also great for the patient. Not every patient is going to really want this or need this, but some of my patients that really have a lot of questions, they're very inquisitive, they enjoy being a part of the process, which is great when they want to, uh, they can also access WebView and see where their treatment is going, which I think, especially if you're in a sort of high-end practice situation and you want to create value for the patient, this is another option because I, you know, I just got back from COIS and doing their week-long course and something that was really emphasized is you need to create value rather than this being some sort of commodity um, where, you, you know, then the patient's going to be asking, why are you charging so much more? What makes you so much more special when I can just go to the lowest bidder? But the patients that have an eye for value, they can sort of see that where what you offer is so much more different. And so um, do I think that you always need technology to achieve a superior outcome? I really don't. But I think that these are things that you can do to set yourself apart, create value for your patients. I do a lot of same day chair side dentistry and I find that patients love to be involved in the process and they get sort of excited when they feel like, well, we really practice technologically advanced dentistry. So going back, now we're in Exoplan or uh, we're in Exocad and then I can just push a button to go into Exoplan with that arrow. Exoplan, this is gonna be a lot more advanced, have a lot more features. And so what I did is I designed this case and I'm gonna take it into Exoplan. I just have to change the script, change a few features on there and go ahead and open it up. So what I've done here is I'm overlaying the design, I hope that looks familiar to you, with the patient's CBCT. And ultimately I'm gonna create a surgical guide. One of the criticisms for fully guided implant placement, which again, there's fully guided, that's where you have a full surgical guide, or you can have sort of partially guided. Um, this is where you're just using a two millimeter twist drill. Um, one of the criticisms with fully guided is that they have issues with the guides never fitting. The guides rock. Uh, it's really let me down several times, but there's a lot of reasons that could be happening and it's not the issue with being fully guided. One of the reasons this might be happening is because you're not actually properly overlaying the design or the patient's arch with the CBCT. So with Exoplan, and I've, I've used other softwares before, but with Exoplan, I find that it gives me a heat map so it can tell me exactly where I'm deficient and where I need to play with it. So with highlighted magenta, that's going to be the design. Of course, that new design is not going to be on the CBCT because it doesn't exist yet. And if it's soft tissue, that's not going to overlay the CBCT, but we want the hard tissue to overlay. And so with this software, I'm getting live feedback for the adjustments I need to make. So then from there, I can toggle through different layers, make it as thick or the threshold as thick as I want to, to make overlaying it as easy as possible and for visualization. So now I'm getting ready and I'm placing the implant in Exoplan. What I also like about this is that virtually every implant on the market that exists is in Exoplan available for you to select and it's constantly updating. Whereas historically I've used Blue Sky Bio, which is actually pretty phenomenal. It's free, um, but you do have to pay to export the guides. So that's a consideration. With Exoplan, you are paying the money up front but then you're not paying to export the guides. Whereas with something like Blue Sky Bio, which really has its benefits, but you're, although it's free, you're paying for the guides. But the problem with Blue Sky Bio is that it doesn't really keep up with the implants. And so what I oftentimes have to do is like plug in the dimensions of the implants, which if it's just a routine everyday tooth, that's not as much of a problem. But if I'm doing something in the anterior aesthetic zone, <laughs> I need this to be dialed in and very predictable. So with this, I selected, I was doing Nobel implant, I selected the implant. And again, this is talk about sort of communication and delivering value to your patients. Um, I was able to show the patient, hey, for the purpose of the primary stability, I want this implant to be in as much good cortical bone as possible. And right now we are impinging on the nasopalatine, the nerve to nasopalatine duct. Um, and so that's a bit of a concern for me just because I'm not gonna have the same sort of stability that I want. Um, in this case, am I necessarily worried about a paresthesia? Not really. In fact, people will place implants in this zone all the time. 
you just need to forewarn the patient that they're gonna have some paresthesia in the anterior most part of their palate. Um, patients don't really complain about that. What's also helpful about this feature is that you can see the implant that's entirely in orange, but then there's that sort of outer boundary in white. That is telling me my definitive limits. And so that's helpful for perhaps if I don't want to impinge on a tooth or an adjacent implant. But with this process, I was able to have an informed conversation with the patient that we are going to want to nucleate part of that nerve and actually place a graft, which I'll show you in a bit. Um, let, me, let me show you the surgery first, uh, but then I'll actually show you literature because the first time I ever did this presentation, someone, um, it wasn't actually a dentist. He seemed very concerned that I was doing this, but that's actually a well-established document of practice where you're just taking, if you can follow my cursor, you're really just taking out this part of the nerve and you're placing a graft, which is a pretty routine practice. The other thing, and I'm glad I can use my cursor so you can see is the patient did have some deficiency uh, of the facial plate. It wasn't much at all, but I wanted this patient to have the most aesthetic outcome possible. And really, if we can get two millimeters of facial play for an implant in the aesthetic zone, that's amazing, but that hardly ever happens. I'm pretty lucky if I can get one to 1 1.5 millimeters, but since we're already there, let's go ahead and graft that facial plate because one of the consequences, and he had a thinner facial, or he had a thinner tissue phenotype. One of the consequences we have with that is we get some show through of the implant. So the tissue will start to look a bluish, blackish type color, especially with these thin phenotypes. And so we did some grafting there as well. So here we go with the grafting. One of the things that's nice is that when you're grafting eight or nine, it has the uh, bony nasal spine right there, which I'm gonna use my cursor. Hopefully you can see. What's nice about that nasal spine is it acts as a bit of a wall. So why do we want walls when we graft? Well, it's really for the blood supply and it also helps to hold the graft in. So as an aside, I know this is a digital <laughs> dentistry webinar, but here you go, you're getting a little perio surgery. And so there is um, the nasal palatine <laughs> duct right there, the nerve, which is probably, I thought this photo was really cool because I'm like, how often do you get to see this? And so we nucleated probably about five to 10 millimeters of it um, and just forewarned him, hey, you're just gonna have a little bit of numbness, probably the size of a quarter right behind your tooth. Is that okay? Yep, no problem. Okay, moving forward. So again, we actually have a lot of literature to support this approach. So here he is. Um, now to get back into the software, and this was a few months later after the graft had fully filled in. Um, and so this was really nice to show him before and after screenshots and say, this is what we were able to achieve. And so he was pretty pleased. Um, now we're finally ready. This is a moment he has been waiting for. Now we're finally ready to place the implant. But as you can see, this case had some complexity and some first possible complications associated with it. But through being able to sit down, chair said with him, and integrally involve him in the process, I was able to get a lot more buy-in from him because he felt like he knew what we were doing. He knew why we were doing it. He had agency. He could speak up if he there was something that he didn't like or didn't want to embark on. Um, and and I, I think that ultimately when we face challenges, I think he was a lot more forgiving of the process because he felt like we took the time to really walk with it through him. I mean, how many other dentists had he been to I sat down with him chair side to talk about the design and, you know, send him home with printouts of what he would look like. So this is another feature that I, I think is kind of convenient. Um, I kind of stumbled on this feature by accident where you can actually just use the arrows to adjust the implant. I can select the longer option. I can select the wider option. Whereas with previous softwares that I have worked with, um, unfortunately, we would have to replace the implant, it was a lot more cumbersome every time we want to make dimensional adjustments. I can also use the measurement feature to measure the distance from the implant to the adjacent to the adjacent um, bone. Additionally, you saw me sort of toggling with it there, trying to make the decision between can we make this cement retained or screw retained. Generally, I like to make my implants screw retained, not so much because the classic reason people will say, oh, I want a cement retained crown 
because I want to prevent any sort of excess cement. Well, it's really not that simple. A lot of times you can adjust the margins. So the margin itself is equigingival. So it makes cement cleanup pretty easy. But the reason I like to do this is more so for retrievability when possible. So you saw me there toggling, just really using the software to kind of determine if it's feasible for me to do a screw routine implant option. So next from there, I'm putting in my guide sleeve and now I'm ready to design the surgical guide because, you know, really, if you, unless you're placing implants, multiple implants day in, day out, I would say most dentists, they want that precision, especially with an anterior implant. So after I place the guide sleeve, then in the exoplane software, now I'm further adjusting it. And what's really nice about this case is that as part of creating the surgical guide, I can put um, sort of timing features on my guide sleeve for the rotation of the implant. Why would you want to do this? Why would this matter? Well, what I was able to do is come into the surgery with a pre-printed um, provisional. And so what you're able to do if you really plan this out very carefully and everything goes according to plan is that you can actually deliver the provisional right then and there. You know, a lot of times we're doing sort of the analog design of the provisionals where we have to, um, we're actually designing a chair side, we might have to go back in the lab, but if you pre-plan the provisionals, you're able to deliver it right then and there, but you have to get the timing and the rotation of the implant absolutely correct. With this feature, I'm able to do put the rotational markers onto the guide itself. And so that's what those purple little dots are. And the rotational markers are implant specific. So some implants might require um, just sort of based on the design of the implant, might require multiple rotational markers. In this case, this is all that I needed. And so this tells me precisely the rotation of the implant that I need to end at so that the delivery of my provisional is seamless. I just plunk it in. <laughs> also, plunking is definitely not a technical term. You'll have to forgive me, but it's just such an appropriate term, I feel like. So now I'm going through and I'm designing the guide itself. There's a few different ways that we can design this guide, but if I design it this way, what's beneficial about it is that I can actually irrigate under the guide um, itself. Anecdotally, I've heard stories of providers that have felt like their implant failed because they weren't able to get irrigant down onto the implant. I don't know exactly if that's truly why it failed, but I know that certainly you don't want the bone to be heating up. You want to give yourself as much um, possibility of success as possible. You know, uh, Linkovicious, he wrote a recent textbook called Zero Bone Loss Concepts. And one of the things that he cites as a reason that implants might fail is because it's getting, the bone's getting too heated up. So you want to be able to get some sort of irrigant down on to the implant um, in your twist drills as you're placing them. So this is this is something the software enables me to do. Um, with other softwares, what I've had to do is more so manually go back and adjust my guide, which or get sort of creative. And that's really not the end of the world, but it's nice that this feature exists. So here's the final guide um, before being printed. And so the way that I adjusted it is actually very similar to the way that I would adjust a ponic tooth in ExoCAD itself, where I can use the add, remove, smooth type feature. So here's my final guide. I was also able to put windows in it, which most softwares allow you to do, but this is really important because you wanna know that you can actually fully seat the guide and see everything to verify that it's seated. Then from there, I use the Formlabs. Formlabs is what we happen to have. I use the Formlabs printer to get it printed. The placement, I'll say this just for your own knowledge, if this is something that you're doing, the placement of the guide is pretty important. You do not want the intaglio surface of the guide uh, being printed with supports. How do I know this? <laughs> because I made this mistake where basically all the supports were on the intaglio surface and the guide was a total waste and had to go in the trash. But even that wasn't actually the end of the world because printing is so cheap um, that we just redid it. I mean, really not the end of the world. So this is the correct positioning of my guide. Hey, Melissa, quick question on your guide design kind of philosophy. I see on this one here, you're doing, you know, more or less 
spanning the full arch for the single placement. I've seen some guides that are much more compact. They might only have one or two adjacent teeth on either side. Like, yeah. what's your rule of thumb there? Do you try to cover as much area on, on the surface as possible to kind of promote stability and and kind of ensure um, or prevent, you know, flexation of the guide when you're placing? Like, how do you, how do you approach that? Great question. Also, it's funny that I jumped because I love when people interrupt me during presentations, and that's funny that I got so startled. But yeah, great question. There, I feel like, are so many different roads to Dallas. So if you want to do a tiny, compact guide, and you have found that you can achieve stability, perfect. Um, one of the challenges, though, is that I did this with a very conservative flap, but I placed the flap nonetheless, and I have somehow sometimes find that in the actual act of retracting the flap again, or retracting the flap back a bit, it seems to somehow push up on the guide a little bit. So if I'm not consciously aware of making sure that the guide is positioned down, that could happen. For me and my sort of practice situation, the technicians that we have, um, unfortunately, they're not doing these sort of surgeries day in and day out constantly with years of experience. And so I don't necessarily feel like I had a dental team where we could really watch the guide. So I like to have a guide that spans the full arch. Um, really with these modern CBCTs, they've cut down on exposure so much because that's the consideration with these guys is I do do a full arch CBCT in a person in order to make these guides because that's really what you're going to need. And some people, they might be concerned about that and feel like, wow, that's a lot of exposure for an implant placement. But um, with these modern CBCTs, we are not getting the same level of exposure. And if I can sort of justify in my head that, yes, this is a bit more exposure to do these full arch CBCTs, but I'm getting really good predictable stability with my guide, then that's all worth it to me. In terms of the materials for the guides, I'm not worried about that. I mean, printing is just so cheap these days that doing a tiny little guide versus a big guide, um, that's not really a concern of mine. But yeah, thank you for asking because there are a lot of very competent, exceptional uh, surgeons that they do very tiny guides. And if they're getting predictability with that, then awesome. <laughs> So again, another benefit though with using this software is that I get a bit of a cookbook um, and for my implant placement. And what I like is that historically with other softwares, I've had to take screenshots of the way that the implant was planned. Um, and what I'll oftentimes do is even though it's fully guided, I'll still have these screenshots to sort of reference my implant placement. So I will use um, the way the implant was planned, and I'll kind of reference that with the PAs of the implant. But with this, I just get a full printout and a guide for really how the implant should look. So here you go. This is my flap um, for the actual surgery. And so anyone who sort of placed a flap like this, you can kind of appreciate that that flap might push up a little bit against the guide. Um, because again, the guide, the way I design them is that they're they're not completely covering the tooth. They're really only covering the tooth about half to two thirds of the way. And so sometimes the flap will push up. But what is nice again is because the first surgery, the grafting was so precise, I did a bit of a papilla sparing incision here, um, which that made it just a very um, smooth surgery. So here you go. I'm first doing my two millimeter twist drill. I designed that guide separately. And then here's my guide for the placement. So here's just different radiographs showing uh, the shaping drills and the two millimeter twist drills, what it looked like. So there you go, there is the final implant placement. And this radiograph, keep in mind, it is distorted because you're gonna look at that and say, wow, that implant is really far apically, but it is distorted. But the other consideration here is that I want the implant immersed in bone. I generally plan my implants where I want it about two to three millimeters from the proposed CEJ. We also crown lengthened uh, this patient at the time of the implant placement as well. And so because you can actually see those finish lines of the final restoration versus CEJ, he actually had really big teeth that we really could afford to crown lengthen. So I went ahead and did that. Um, so let's just circle back again to the challenges that we might face. And it's funny because I'm only halfway through this presentation, so 
we'll just have to do the rest on another date. But let's just talk about those again. The challenges that we face with our treatment planning and with our implant placement are challenges with precision, communication, and case acceptance. Through the road that I took to approaching this case, I was able to achieve good communication. The patient and everybody, the lab, everyone on the team knew what we were doing and why. We were able to anticipate possible roadblocks that we might encounter so that I'm not doing a lot of backtracking with the patient. I also got good case acceptance. And, um, you know, I some pay, some schools of thought are really like, we got to get buy-in from the spouse. You know, the spouse's opinion is the most important. I think it just depends on the dynamic of their relationship. This patient spouse did happen to be very, very, very involved. And so it was really nice for her to even know this is our roadmap. This is what we can expect. These are the challenges that we might face. And so I think that built a lot of rapport. And then finally, for a case that was this challenging, we were able to get good precision. We were able to execute on what it was that we worked so hard to plan. So with that, we have about nine minutes. Um, I will open this up to any questions. Um, and really, there is, I, I know this sounds so trite, but there is no dumb question. <laughs> so if anyone has any questions, or even if Neil has a commentary, and one person that really deserves a lot of credit, um, but I, I wish I mentioned this at the start, is Andy, who's on this call. Uh, he's an exceptional educator and teacher, and he really taught me a lot of tricks and concepts. So I do want to thank Andy for his involvement. I also want to thank Neil for being so easy to work with. Well, you're more than welcome, Dr. Seibert. It's a pleasure having you on as well. Um, I don't see any questions here coming through on the, the Q&A, uh, but we'll leave a few minutes open here to just kind of um, see if anybody has any last minute thoughts or, or questions that they want to bring to the table here. Um, I'll um, take a few moments here to just let everybody know that we have a follow up email that we'll be sending out to everybody who registered tonight. Um, that'll make a, a available a recording of this presentation and uh, as well as um, a kind of link they can follow up on if they want to pursue any of the software that you highlighted, which you spoke about both dental CAD, which is what people commonly refer to as ExoCAD, right? They, they say ExoCAD, what they really mean is dental CAD, and that's the design platform that ExoCAD produces. You also spoke about ExoPlan, which is the implant planning software. Um, and the two of those integrate together extremely well, which is what allows you to do the type of prosthetic driven implant planning that that you kind of described in your presentation. Um, so we'll have a link available for everybody to kind of pursue those things that they want to learn a little bit more. So let me actually add to that too, if that's okay. Two important considerations. Yeah. One is, you know, I think, I hope on this presentation it never came across as selling. That's really not the purpose of any of this. Um, Imagine's really supported me in my sort of digital journey. And so um, there's a lot of things that, the ExoCAD software gets right. And so I want to highlight that, but um, everything has its challenges. And so really, I hope I didn't come across as salesy. I'm receiving no compensation for any of this. But the other thing is I also want to clarify as well, what is ExoCAD? Because I didn't even talk about that. So, and sort of why would a dentist be interested in ExoCAD itself? So ExoCAD is an umbrella term, which encompasses sort of the dental CAD app, which is what we most commonly think of as ExoCAD. That's where you can design cases, you can do treatment planning, you can design crowns, veneers, partials, complete dentures, everything. I mean, it's all, it's an entire lab in one. And then there's ExoPlan. This is the implant design uh, software where you can do implant planning, you can do guides. So yeah. that's all the umbrella of ExoCAD. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of people don't realize that distinction there. I'm also really glad that you took time to talk about communication because I think it's one of the biggest benefits of digital dentistry that a lot of people don't realize when they go into it. Um, you know, they go into it for the agility, right? Or maybe like the predictability, right? Or just the ability to produce their own provisionals or guides or what have you. But when you leverage it for communication with the patient and then, you know, um, extending outwards the patient's family, um, it, it, you know, that level of transparency, like you said, it, it promotes trust and trust promotes case acceptance, right? You know, I'm sure on the provider side, everybody likes to think that they have a great rapport and trust with their patient. Um, and I'm sure most of the time that's true, but you know, from myself being more 
in the chair than chair side, you know, um, it's uh, it takes time to build up some really, you know, deep trust with with your dentist, you know, and that level of transparency and just kind of being like, hey, here, this is this is what we're doing and why. What do you think? You know, um, I think that that is a tremendous trust builder and a great communication tool. So I'm, I'm glad you took the time to kind of highlight that. I'm a big proponent of that idea. Um, I think looks like we know, do have a question coming through here from yeah from Blanca. Do you, you can see that on your screen there? So she wants to know: Do you need Exocad to pull in the CBCT scan and design with the CBCT and Exocad um, viewer image of the scan? So do you need Exo? Sorry, Neil. Do you want to explain? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. So so with Dental CAD. Um, there is a module called DICOM Viewer, and DICOM Viewer is what allows you to bring in that CBCT data and and view it, um, you know, kind of uh, overlaid with your, you know, uh, pre-op scan, your post-op scan, or any any other meshes that you want to add on to it. Um, Blanca, if you don't have the DICOM Viewer module, that could be why you're having trouble loading those files in there, but um, it can be added to any dental CAD license that is current on its maintenance, and um, I think it's a pretty affordable module as they go. So you can also pull CBCT data into, into Exoplan, of course, um as it's you know obviously pretty necessary but <laughs> yeah for getting it into dental dental cad that's all you need is the dicom viewer module awesome well neil thank you so much are there any other questions or closing remarks uh, i think we have one i see somebody typing something here so we'll give them a moment to finish their thought and uh and we'll see what they have to say there awesome awesome um well thank you all so much for having me i'll let them type their question real fast. But um, yeah, thank you for helping me out. Yeah, and shout out to Andy. <laughs> like he's going to be doing an upcoming webinar with uh, my boy, Dennis Hartley. Um, yes. So, yeah, that's awesome. So my um, course on Exacad is going to go live in a few weeks with Dental Online Training. So. Nice. Yeah, that's a great organization and we're, we're glad to be kind of working with them. And I happen to know that, you know, I've seen Andy's kind of uh, outline for what he's planning for that. And it's kind of a lot of the um, common mis misconceptions uh, or misperceptions about ExoCAD of people coming from the fully analog traditional side. A lot of the things that they think are going to be hurdles or pitfalls um, that really aren't true once you kind of get acquainted with the software. So we're looking forward to that one big time. Awesome. Well, it looks like we're out of questions. Um, so I will wish you guys a good night. Sound awesome. Good? Thank you so much, Dr. Seibert. It was a, it was a real pleasure having you here. Um, oh, is there information to register for that upcoming training? Yeah. So Blanca, just um, check the chat a little bit further up there for the link that I provided. Fill out that form so you can get in touch with us and we'll make sure to make that login information available to you. Um, and we look forward to seeing everybody there. And thanks again, Dr. Seibert. We appreciate you and everybody who joined us tonight. Thank you for your time. We hope you learned something here and look for that follow up email from us for a copy of the recording. And uh, yeah, thanks, everybody. Happy cat camming. Thank you.